good morning good afternoon good evening everyone uh, as the case may be for you welcome to this uh, webinar by fintech and asian bankers association uh, the first one for 2024 and in keeping that is the first one for 2024 we thought we'll talk about the you know aml compliance priorities uh, you know for the year to come so as we all know in aml cft the regulatory landscape continues to evolve and staying ahead of emerging trends and challenges is absolutely crucial for reporting entities that are committed to maintaining the highest standards of aml compliance so in uh, today's webinar uh, we have four aml cft experts uh, from across australia cambodia and singapore who will discuss uh, challenges as well as their top few priority areas for the year to come but before we begin let me thank the asian bankers association for being long standing partners with fintech for these webinars as well as our other workshops we are truly grateful to them for their support uh, in today's webinar we've got uh, more than uh, 1000 people registered uh, with uh, over 500 live and also some now being redirected to youtube um so our uh, let me quickly uh, introduce our panelists uh, for the webinar today Uh, the first one is uh, Naren Kork, who is head of compliance and certified compliance officer at SBI LYR Bank from Cambodia. Uh, Naren has more than 15 years of experience in compliance and AML and CFT in both local as well as regional banks, and she has passed many uh, professional AML and CFT courses. Uh, welcome, welcome, Naren, to the webinar. Our uh, second panelist is. uh kanvolik shiv who is the head of compliance at wuri bank cambodia uh she has a wealth of experience working in the aml cft field for a number of years in commercial banks and has grown through the ranks from an officer level to her current role uh, her priority at the bank has been to implement all the control measures for identification assessment and mitigation of aml cft risk and form forming the compliance culture within the bank So welcome, Shanvolik. Our third panel, our third panelist uh, uh, for today is Rupa Sushil, uh, based in Singapore. She is the compliance lead and MLRO at Anchorage Digital. Rupa has over seventeen years of experience working for highly regulated entities such as financial as well as non-banking financial institutions across the Asia Pacific region. her areas of expertise include compliance advisory strategy development bsa aml sanctions anti bribery corruption as well as fraud risk management uh, welcome rupa to this uh, webinar today thank you for having me shreesh our uh, fourth and final panelist is luke raven uh, senior partner of financial crime compliance at bank of queensland uh, in australia and based in melbourne Uh, Luke, as many of you know, is a top voice in uh, AML on LinkedIn with more than 15 years of experience in financial crime, including fraud, sanctions, and AML at many of Australia's leading banks and global fintech companies. So, uh, Luke, welcome to this webinar. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. All right. So, uh, you know, as always, audience, uh, post your questions to panelists in the Q and A uh, section. There's a button at the bottom of the screen, uh, and we will take them up towards the end of the webinar. Today's discussion will not have any uh, PowerPoint presentations. It's going to be completely interactive. It's going to be a conversation, uh, and uh, you know, all of you who attend the complete webinar will receive a certificate of participation. As always, uh, if you don't. Uh, Uh, you know, attend most of it. Uh, you will not get the certificate, and uh, the system will let us know who's attended everything, right? So, uh, so again, welcome, welcome to all the panelists, and uh, you know, let me start with uh, the first round uh, of questions. And uh, Luke, I think you're uh, you're going to be the last in the line because you know we're going to do ladies first, and you know three of them are ladies, so uh, you know you're going to be fourth in line at least for the first round. <laughs> Chivalry is not dead. I'm more than fine with this order. <laughs> <laughs> right so let me start with uh, rupa so uh, rupa um, you know 2023 last year has been an interesting year you know for virtual assets with large enforcement actions across the world right singapore has been at the forefront of regulatory change and is also signaling to the crypto world uh, and to everyone really that crypto is here to stay 
uh, but you know with some disclaimers maybe so you know how has the evolving crypto industry uh, actually reacted so far to these regulatory changes that happened uh, in the last uh, year and you know uh, what is your outlook uh, for 2024 if you can you know speak a bit about that so over to you thank you shiresh uh, let me uh, go back in terms you know from talking from 2023 and then moving forward what do we see from an outlook standpoint right so there have been many cha many challenges over the past 12 months but i think uh, we all are very excited within crypto for uh, crypto industry to see the renewed focus on crypto regulations and serious policy making discussions around crypto market structure across different geographies uh, we at Anchorage are very closely analyzing all these regulatory developments. And here is our short analysis. Uh, from country perspective, we, we see that countries can be grouped into three different buckets, right? So the first category of countries are those that have be, that have adopted licensing, registration rules, and strict KYC requirements for consumers and institutions using a tech-neutral approach. So what does that tech-neutral approach mean? Is regulators using existing laws applicable for trade fi to be applied from crypto company standpoint, irrespective of the fact that crypto, which is an underlying technology, is relatively new and different from trade fi industry standpoint. Regulators are of the view here that existing laws are broad enough to cover the crypto industry, and they use uh, there is no uh, an underlying assessment. Uh, taken into account from the new technology standpoint um, and the common notion I think here generally which the regulators use is same activity, same risk, such same regulations. So now moving on to the second bucket of, bucket of countries are those which have come up with creating comprehensive and facilitating legal frameworks. Multiple countries are in this process of developing clear, comprehensive uh, regulations from crypto industry standpoint. To name a few, Thailand, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, uh, South Korea, Switzerland, UAE, and UK. These are like some of the names which I can recall. And this is a significant win for crypto industry that has faced many instances of hostility and threats of ban over the years. Uh, at the same time, you know, we see the regulators are picking up, they are identifying the crypto risks, but we also see uh, strict regulations being imposed, uh, strict uh, licensing requirements, KYC rules, which hurts the industry sentiments of operating in a complete autonomous and decentralized manner. So now moving on to the third set of countries, right? So these are the countries which have decided to not accept acknowledge cryptocurrencies as a legal tender and crypto operating companies as regulated institutions. So there are no regulatory agencies appointed, no uh, regulations or policies being designed, and there's no guidelines from the regulator standpoint. Some of these countries that I can identify are India and Nigeria. China continues to take its stand on outright banning cryptocurrency transactions in the country. So amongst all, within Asia Pacific, we see that Singapore and Hong Kong seem to lead the regulatory landscape in Asia with many crypto firms expanding their businesses in these jurisdictions. While Hong Kong and Singapore have emerged as a high profile crypto hubs, we also see other countries such as Japan, uh, South Korea and Taiwan have also formulated relevant regulations and guidelines for this industry. So to complete my thoughts and to answer your question, Shirish, uh, as you heard, there are many countries within Asia and outside that have taken steps to move ahead and be deliberate and thoughtful about the infrastructure, risk management and compliance requirements necessary to rebuild trust and to open access to institutional and retail investors. In 2024, we expect more regulatory oversight, uh, and with more regulatory oversight comes BSA AML cost and expenses, consumer protection measures, which are very critical in terms of rebuilding trust and stability for the crypto industry. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rupa, for that. Uh, you know, very crisp and clear uh, uh, outline and analysis. Uh, let me let me now uh, you know move on to. Our two panelists from uh, Cambodia, uh, Naren and uh, Shanvolik, uh, 
uh, Narendra first, maybe. You know, so considering that Cambodia was, uh, you know, taken off the grey list uh, last year, uh, the FATF grey list. Uh, you know, what do you think the banking and finance industry should prioritize in this year to ensure that the FATF standards continue to be adhered to in Cambodia? So maybe Narendra, if you can. Respond to that first uh, from a Cambodia point of view, and then after that, I will request Sanbodi to uh, respond as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sirius, for the question. Uh, in 2023, uh, it was a great uh, achievement for Cambodia, especially to the regulator effort to move Cambodia from the grey list. So we may have a different expectation based on the position we stand for. Like the regulator, they may have a point of view of priority. And uh, the banking sector, they have a different uh, point of view. So uh, for me as the banking sector, I have a um, priority for the AMR CFT in 2024, uh, focusing on the uh, collaboration, engagement and update. So the collaboration meaning we have to collaborate uh, with the regulator for any request of the document, for any request of information and make sure that all the information we uh, provide to the regulator uh, can have the regulator in the area of the assessment. So the, also the engagement. Uh, so far, we have a great uh, engagement uh, in the committee. We have engaged all uh, comply and also engagement with the regulator. So we have to make sure that uh, we can practice and implement uh, of the uh, ML and CFT follow the applicable law and regulation. And the other one I said, uh, it is on the update. So we have to be ready for the update of the technology, the new trend of the AML and CFT. So uh, we, are, we may be mature uh, for the AML and CFT. And also we have to be mature and work uh, the same as the uh, criminal or terrorist because they may also stay in update than us as well. And uh, the other priority that uh, we can have to maintain the FAT recom recommendation uh, compliance uh, from the banking sector, we may focus on the uh, proliferation financing. Even it is similar like the AMR CFT, but uh, it may have a different in nature. So we have to make sure that uh, the reassessment, the customer due diligence, or the risk uh, from the uh, PF may include in our CDD or KYC uh, practice. And um, the other one, uh, maybe we focus on the um, UBO information. Uh, actually, the SOFA have uh, many challenges because uh, we cannot have the public uh, source to search on the beneficial uh, owner and may have a different challenge from a different bank and different standard as well. So we can see uh, the great journey of the US, the FinCEN that just start to reporting on the UBO of the corporate uh, company. So uh, we wish we can have uh, this uh, journey start in uh, Cambodia soon. So uh, at our banking sector, uh, this is the requirement uh, from the uh, AMR CFT. So we need to, uh, based on the effort, try to uh, identify who is the beneficial owner of the bank. PO information is uh, one of the recommendations uh, that still remain a PC for Cambodia. So uh, as the banking sector, we need to conduct a proper and robust due diligence to identify uh, who is the beneficial owner of the corporate. And I think the other one uh, priority is on the um, anti-bribery and corruption and also the tax evasion as well because uh, it may uh, contribute to the risk of money laundering as well. So uh, this is the point of view from banking sector that uh, we can uh, prioritize in order to make sure Cambodia still uh, remain uh, compliant to the FATF recommendation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Narendra, for that uh, uh, opening. Uh, Sanvali, can we hear from you? Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, regarding to the Cambodia have listed in the grey list uh, in 2019, of course, it was under the subject of uh, increased monitoring. Uh, and with that, uh, Cambodia have established um, its strategy to improve and it measure for the uh, anti-money laundering and combating financing of terrorist regime. 
and enhance effectiveness control to meet the commitment action plan. So uh, in in the um, significant progress and of the improvement, uh, currently Cambodia have been delisted from the gray list. So to that, as a bank, we have uh, robustly implemented the control to ensure the effectiveness measure, including the implementation enhancements of the AMOS-CFT system, such as uh, uh, screenings, uh, such as transaction monitoring, and the uh, identification of the customer risk rating for counter the relationship with the customer. So set out the mitigation measure for uh, MRCFT programs and ongoing improvements, uh, such as update from time to time of the parameter of the transaction monitoring uh, to follow the trends of the ML and FT risk. And as well to uh, reflect the uh, M ML and FT risk uh, toward the business behavior as well, such as the new product and service that the bank have uh, employed, and especially the digital, uh, digitalizations that we involve with the payment system as well. And uh, enforcing and control to each type of the customer uh, that we have in as the relationship, uh, like uh, uh, earlier Naren have mentioned about the UBO identification, customer religion, and this is the most importantly uh, uh, that uh, uh, including the reporting that um, we ask. Uh, identify the suspicious transaction, the suspicious uh, uh, behavior of the customer to be reported to our regulator and to protect the bank from be, uh, the victim of the ML and FT scheme. And regarding to that, I uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, in terms of uh, uh, commercial bank in Cambodia, we we uh, mostly have received the um, on-site visiting from our regulators so that they are highlighted on the PF law regarding to the UBO identification, regarding to the customer restricting of a, a political exposed person such as foreign uh, 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 political exposed persons and how to document and identify them before we onboarding them and how proper documentations of screening to ensure that we are uh, 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 fully complies to the uh, regulatory requirement. So um, I think that uh, 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 regarding to this as well, uh, it's um, uh, the the compliance and responsibility of, is to provide the understanding to all the the staff, the management, the the to whom ever have to be implemented the uh, account opening and in terms of operating a business. So they need to understand the idea of uh, uh, why we we require to um, implement the MRCFT program. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anvarit, uh, for that. Uh, for that. Uh, for your comments. Uh, let me now, uh, you know, move to Luke. Uh, finally, so Luke, uh, you know, being based in Australia, uh, what would you say is the general outlook uh, for AML CFT in Australia, especially since you know the country has embarked on, uh, you know, many many uh, reforms to its AML CFT regime. Uh, can you take us through some of these um, uh, changes or proposed changes? And you know what would you say will be the likely impact of these proposed changes uh, on banks and FIs in the year to come? Yeah, absolutely. So generally, I, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I think the outlook is is pretty good, all things considered, in Australia. Uh, just for context for your attendees, the AML regime in its current form came into Australia in 2006 and 2007 with two different acts of parliament. They've been revised over a hundred times since then with minor revisions, but there's never been sort of a structural revamping of the whole thing. Uh, and unfortunately, it hasn't aged well. It's not it's not aging beautifully like I am. Uh, it, it very much looks uh, like a product of its time. So with that in mind, um, FADEF came and, and had a mutual evaluation of us uh, last time in 2015. They had a whole suite of recommendations um, that we really need to get going on. Uh, and our Australian Attorney General's office has now embarked on a consultation process with industry, but it's already a couple months behind. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to be reviewed again by FATF in, um, in 2026 by the most likely uh, estimate. Before then, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but yeah, generally, we're optimistic. So the reform package is... is is going to have a huge impact and it's going to be really positive. Uh, a lot of us are hoping for the existing reporting entities. So we really want sensible reforms that make checking the box, we all hate that phrase, don't we? But, you know, checking the box on compliance easier 
because uh, once you've done that, that's when we can actually focus on the real meat on the bone and, and go for actual outcomes and effectiveness, the stuff that gets us out of bed. So an example that we're all, you know, waiting with bated breath to see if we get is uh, is the adoption of a UK style tipping off provision as opposed to what we have in Australia. So in the UK, it focuses very much more on actual harm that you should not allow to happen. So don't prejudice a law enforcement investigation, makes sense. In Australia, it's much more rigid and, and um, it's, it's just an absolute fact. You cannot allow anybody to infer even that an SMR, which is our version of a SAR, has been filed. So little quality of life, things like that. Um, also, we have a really, really uh, sort of strict regime that requires an AML program in two specific parts, part A and part B. Part B is where you put your KYC, part A is everywhere else. It's kind of rigid and, and unnecessarily formulaic. So a, a little bit of uh, renovation work would, would be in order. But the biggest change, so that those are all the things for banks and financial institutions that are already regulated, but the biggest change that, that could come through, and we're all thinking it will, is actually regulation of our gatekeeper professions. So the uh, uh, DNFPBs is the is the way that uh, FATF calls them, the uh, non-financial professional businesses. Lawyers, accountants, real estate industry players uh, for the first time. So illicit actors, if you look at any of the big busts in Australia, even in Singapore, they're, they're using these sectors. Uh, and Australia is one of the last FATF countries to delay bringing them into the AML fold. If that happens, and it probably will, uh, then it'll mean adding over 100,000 newly regulated entities for the very first time to the regime in Australia. So it's a big opportunity. Uh, it's going to be a big challenge as well. But generally, the outlook is really positive. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lou, for that. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, after we've done with this first round of uh, questions, let's quickly run a poll for the audience to see what they're thinking. Uh, can we have the poll up, please? So what do you think will be the biggest challenge for your AML team in 2024? Will it be recruiting and re retaining skill resources? Is it getting new budgets, uh, new technology, managing regulatory expectations, or keeping pace with evolving risks? So uh, let's give the audience uh, for 30 seconds to respond to it. And then it would be great if uh, some of the panelists could quote on, could, uh, you know, uh, uh, comment on uh, some of the answers that are coming in. Well, luckily, nobody is saying other, so. Maybe give it a few seconds more. Okay, that's it. Um, panelists, can you see the uh, poll results on your screens? Uh, any any comments? So we've got about 19% uh, of the audience uh, which has said that uh, uh, skilled resources is a challenge. 19% has said technology uh, uh, budgets are a challenge. 18% have said that regulatory expectations uh, are a challenge. And... Uh, 44% have said that, uh, you know, keeping pace with MLTF risks is a challenge. Uh, any of the panelists would you like to comment on this? Yeah, if I may, uh, I, I agree with 44% of you. And I'd, I'd like to point out that the, the rest of you are sort of saying internal problems or regulators or customers or stakeholders are a problem. I, I like the last one because we're here to fight bad guys. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. Uh, they're changing at a, at a crazy rate. And all of the other stuff is important too, but it's to allow us to do that last thing. That's my answer anyway. <laughs> I I agree with uh, Luke here. So keeping pace with evolving money laundering, terrorist financing risk is very critical because we have seen from the past that all these money launderers or sanctions evaders, they are all ahead of the regulations and the regulators and they think much more faster and they have even more greater technology or they understand the underlying technology so well that they're able to come up with solutions, right, in terms of evading. We recently saw in Singapore where Singapore regulators uh, have identified money laundering case worth of $3 billion 
right? So this is all a joint effort between banks, regulated entities, crypto exchanges, so on and so forth to identify all these individuals involved in it. Uh, and I would like to say as well that um, regarding to uh, uh, they, uh, the criminal, they always run uh, ahead of us. I mean, like, okay, when one is caught up them, then they will find a way to find another uh, path to uh, 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 do another scheme. So, of course, technology is improving so as them as well. They are always on the top of the technologies and they are on the top of the, uh, to find a way how to um, committing those crimes and uh, to uh, to fraud, to uh, creating the schemes and how to build a story for that the victim can fall into uh, their scheme. So this is a very challenging that uh, uh, not only we are established the control, but we also have to understand that how we can to uh, ensure that uh, we are on the same path and uh, following to the trends of the uh, AML, CFT, uh, 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 tap, uh, topologies and the cash that they are involved. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Yes. I also agree on the 44, uh, as I mentioned, because uh, the criminal uh, may be more expert and professional in money laundering. So uh, we, as the baker or uh, uh, the other uh, sector, have to cannot walk behind them, but we have to uh, walk far from them. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. All right. Um, let me stop the poll sharing. Um, look, coming back to you, you know, uh, there have been reports uh, of rising involvement of organized crime groups, right, in financial crime in Australia. Uh, what would you say are some of the uh, money laundering risks and typologies, you know, that financial institutions and banks should prioritize in terms of monitoring and controls for this particular risk? Yeah, look, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, recent times, organized crime is a business, uh, and in my view, they've they've pivoted, especially due to the influence of COVID, the emergence of AI, and and other great technologies for committing foul deeds. So I think fraud is front and center. I honestly do. I think it's it's becoming syndicated. Uh, we we know that pig butchering is a is a global issue. Um, and it's fueled by human trafficking and, and scams and all of this sort of stuff. So it, it's awful, right? And the antidote is not AI. It's not some um, crazy new way of thinking. Fraud's the name of the game, and KYC is is the solution. It should be top of mind for everyone in 2024. Um, it's a little bit of an indictment of where we are as an industry that I don't think a lot of people are doing it correctly still. Uh, and it goes beyond just knowing who your customer says they are. Um, and it should also match with what they're doing. So as financial challenges mount, fraud is more appealing. Becoming a money mule is more appealing. It's not enough to know anymore. That account belongs to Luke Raven. We also need to understand why he's doing what he's doing and whether those funds that he's receiving are legitimate or illicit in origin. Uh, so th this KYT as part of KYC and understanding the customer's profile, I think that this is absolutely paramount. And I, I think this is fairly international, um, but I, I certainly come from an Australian perspective. So if, if any of the other panelists want to correct me, uh, please feel free. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Uh, panelists, any, any, uh, would any of you like to weigh in on that particular point? Um, I like to hear uh, a little bit that um, how we we uh, are planning to do and how we wanted to implement into the uh, uh, the banks to set this control. I mean, like they always have a new trends of the uh, uh, AML and CFT uh, scheme. So from time to time, we are mainly focused to also update our uh, trends monitoring parameter. We setting the rule, we setting the uh, um, the statistic to see and to give other guidance that okay, what we can see, uh, what are the transaction the transactions are really increased, what kind of the product are really uh, 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 like um, in the uh, very popular product that they are used by the customer. So we are keep the precautions that okay, if in terms of that statistic and in terms of that uh, uh, trends, then what we can be putting as a control to set a limit, a threshold, the uh, uh, parameter to set that, okay, we need to review those kind of transactions. We need to uh, monitoring those trend of uh, 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 flow or uh, the trend of the um, the usage of the product and the service within the bank so that uh, this is the one 
point that we can add as an, our control to to really uh, be um, I mean, like uh, we we try to catch them. Of course, we cannot be so far uh, uh, behind them. So at least we are closing to them. That okay, there is a trend. There is a new way of doing thing, and then we need to find a way whether this is a uh, uh, which uh, uh, genius place or is somehow involved in the scam or there are new uh, uh, schemes uh, typology. You know. So yeah. So this is um I can share. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Anulik. Uh, Rupa, uh, you know, moving over to you, uh, you know, what is your opinion on, you know, how can crypto players, uh, especially companies like yours, you know, which deal with institutional players, uh, how can they continue to build trust uh, amongst investors? Interesting topic. So 2023, again, I'm just going back 2023 and then going to talk about what has happened and then going forward, how we continue to build trust amongst investors, right? So 2023 was an interesting year for the digital asset industry as a whole with numerous headlines, TV talk shows, podcasts devoted on the developments in the industry. On one hand, the industry witnessed uh, it came up from recovering from the huge collapse of uh, most well-known crypto exchanges and players, as well as the value of most prominent cryptocurrencies uh, improving over the years of historical erosion in value. So we also noted increased enforcement action on crypto players from regulators all across the world. Shirish, as you pointed out at the beginning, right? So uh, US has proven to be one of the most active enforcers of penalties and legal action against crypto companies in 2023. Uh, SEC in the U.S. has brought cases against five crypto exchanges in 2023, including the big names, uh, Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, alleging that they sold unregistered securities via the platforms. Well, Binance was ordered to pay more than $4 billion to U.S. authorities as penalty, including its former CEO pleading guilty for violating U.S. AML and sanctions requirements. Right. So um, on one hand, we saw that U.S. taking the lead on enforcement. Singapore was not far behind, too. We noted Singapore's Commercial Affairs Department launching an investigation on regulated crypto firm, uh, Hoddle Nord and its directors for possible criminal law violations. MAS also reprimanded Three Arrow Capital for providing false information to MAS and exceeding assets and the management threshold allowed for a registered fund management company. So on the other side of the spectrum, after many years of hostility and ban on the cryptocurrency market, I think the regulators and trade fund institutions have now realized that crypto is here to stay long time. This, together with the fact that regulators in various jurisdictions are coming up with regulatory framework, clear policy guidelines for crypto players, has resulted in increased investor confidence, particularly institutional investors. So we saw many institutional investors have either entered or plan to enter the cryptocurrency market, either via ETFs or directly trading cryptocurrencies. This has resulted in increased demand for regulated and safe digital asset custodians. So there was a study, I'm just going to refer back, uh, which was conducted by EY in late 2023, that shows that institutions are moving forward with their plans to invest optimistically, but cautiously, with majority of them, you know, currently taking invested or staying invested between one to 5% of their portfolios into digital assets or related products. So in choosing custodians for digital assets, I think institutional investors are more worried and concerned about security, uh, regulatory compliance, commingling of assets, bankruptcy remoteness, etc., which seems to be a natural tendency for any institutional investors, right? Because they always feel comfortable with regulated institutions for these reasons. So at Anchorage Digital, we have long believed more crypto institutions need to come under the umbrella of regulatory supervision. That's why we pursued a federal banking charter for our affiliate Anchorage Digital Bank and ultimately became one and only federally chartered bank in the U.S. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rupa. Uh, okay, let's uh, move again to our panelists in uh, Cambodia. And, you know, we spoke a bit about the FATF gray listing and, you know, now the country is out of that. I think governance is uh, going to be paramount. So let's talk a bit about, you know, on the, you know, 
AML compliance culture. So, uh, Naren and uh, Shanbolik, you know, how do you think banks and FIs can actually foster a culture of AML compliance uh, and accountability, right, through the organization? Any thoughts on that? Yes, thank you. So, uh, for awareness on the compliance, uh, we have many approach, and everybody may be uh, familiar with the word uh, tone at the top. And actually, it is uh, from the audit firm, but I think it's still uh, the valid and applicable to apply in the situation. So, uh, tone at the top is the commitment from the board, from the senior management, and from everyone in the company. So we can see uh, many uh, behavior and uh, decision that uh, reflect the tone uh, at the top of the board and the senior management, like the budget approval on the uh, compliance cost, like uh, the incorporate of the uh, compliance culture in uh, the governance, and the other thing uh, that have the clear vision of the uh, tone at the top. And normally, uh, all the staff will uh, uh, follow and understand this. Another thing to improve the compliance awareness uh, to the company or to the bank, to make sure that uh, compliance is not uh, comply only in paper, but uh, in the spirit, apply the uh, compliance uh, scorecard and KPI setting for uh, the involving staff. So this one uh, may be painful, but it is a good approach. Without the enforcement, then they will not do and follow. So I think it is the best uh, approach. Uh, then they can understand and also they can uh, do uh, what the law requires. The other thing, uh, I think uh, it is on the reinforcement, on the training. I think that sometimes the training uh, from compliance and MLS is so boring. So I think uh, we can simplify and then uh, make it a uh, thought, but uh, try to provide them the concept and mindset because uh, everyone uh, will understand and believe and will do what they believe. So that is why uh, we have to embed uh, this in their mindset. And the other thing, uh, the other solution, I think it is on the uh, mindset might that try to change their concept that compliance uh, just only the pointer so uh, we may be their partner uh, to provide them the understanding about the risk so they will be uh, aware that the compliance is not only uh, compliant to the regulation but it may go beyond the regulation because uh, sometimes uh, it shapes their behavior and also their uh, characteristic as well so every time uh, we uh, provide them uh, the uh, finding. We also need to explain them uh, what they need to do and what they need to know the risk as well. Thanks, thanks, Lorraine. Uh, Thank you. Everybody, can we have your... Uh, uh... Yes. So, um, setting the ground to the compliance culture is um, very challenging. But um, instead of sharing the awareness to my experience, uh, to foster uh, the culture is not telling what to do but to address the question how to protect them from being the victim of the ML and FT activity. And the reason why we need to fight the ML and FT. So it is not to, uh, to be compliant with the regulations, but it is to, to have the nation from the insecurity, to prevent the criminal activity, to stop the uh, predicate offense that led to the violations and the security disruptions. To, to do that, uh, we conducting the training from time to time to enforce on the understanding of the importance of the uh, combating ML and FT activity. And to that as well, we are ensuring that training, uh, uh, the understanding uh, are delivered effectively. Uh, to, to my experience, I develop uh, on the awareness programs uh, where every month uh, we send the, out the uh, case study, definitions, process, uh, news, uh, and any regulation update uh, to all the level of staff, including the um, uh, from the uh, implementer to the board level, so that uh, this is as the reminder 
and the awareness to keep them interesting into the importance of the uh, ML and CFT. And by setting the ground to the culture here, it's not only for the like a stakeholder that the compliant handling with, but also internally our compliant team as well to ensure that they have the skill, they have the, the, the correct uh, understanding, and they have uh, 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 their professions to uh, convince and to interpret this uh, uh, conversations to all the stakeholders that this is a, a really important so we need to be internally consistent to each other as well that uh, this is a very uh, uh, a ground step for us thanks thanks uh, okay uh, one final question for all of you before we move to audience questions um, you know really the outcome of this uh, webinar today uh, you know, the top five priorities for AML compliance in your organization for this year. So uh, may I request each of you to sort of list out what are the top five priorities that you would have for this year? So maybe starting with Luke. Sure, I should mention I'm speaking for myself. I don't speak for any organization. But um, I, as a professional in this space, uh, I do have five. I've got KYC. First and foremost, I'm nothing if not a broken record. It is of paramount importance. If you get KYC wrong, you get everything else wrong, and not every entity has got all of their KYC correct. Um, secondly is effectiveness. People will stand up on a soapbox and tell you that box checking is terrible, rah, rah, rah. You have to check the boxes. That's regulation and compliance with regulation. It's in the name. But it doesn't have to be all we do. So effectiveness as a focus is going beyond just checking those boxes okay um cooperation there's no combating all of this without effective cooperation we're talking public private partnerships we're talking private private partnerships a lot of the time the public sector cannot keep up with the resourcing uh and and sophistication essentially of the of the private sector so private to private partnerships uh, in Australia, we've, we've got some of these in Singapore, they're doing some very interesting stuff. I think that this is going to continue and, and has to be uh, continued. It's it's necessary for us to have a real impact. Uh, fourth, I, I'm, I haven't lost count, fourth, um, a holistic approach. So fraud begets money laundering. You can't really do money laundering without committing fraud. And nation states are involved and rogue actors and sanctions become enlivened as well. We're going to find, uh, you know, countries placing pressure on one another to say, hey, there's a lot of financial flows going there that are basically ripping off our, and our citizens. Can you stop that? Otherwise, we may have to consider a sanctions package. Just this week, Australia has done something relatively unprecedented. We've, we've sanctioned a cyber attacker from last year from, from Russia, who's potentially a member of a, a state-backed organization there. Uh, and that was followed on then from the UK and, and the OFAC. So you know, I think that this holistic approach is going to continue. And then the last thing, I'm not sure if everyone can see, I had some tech difficulties, I had a better camera, but it's not working. But I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my shirt here. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, it says, it says follow the money. Um, it's not super relevant, except for the fact that I'm very, very passionate about what we do. And I think that, uh, was it Naren said uh, around the perception that we're boring? We, we all need to be super passionate about our jobs. That passion is infectious. It'll get people that historically have been on the fence on the side. And what we do, when we do it well, saves lives. So that's that's absolutely uh, important for all of us to take away from this. Now I'll shush and hand to someone else. Well said, well said, Luke. Uh, Rupa, uh, over to you. Your type, top five uh, compliance priorities for this year. Yeah, sure. So as... Briefed earlier, 2023, we saw increased regulatory scrutiny, increased enforcement actions on crypto industry, right? So it is quite clear that regulatory bodies are growing their understanding of crypto landscape and are working closely with crypto players and, you know, public-private partnership and building up and shaping regulations for crypto, uh, crypto players. Singapore and Hong Kong regulators are very engaged uh, at the industry level. They do seek feedback from the industry players, blockchain associations and committees to bring the crypto players and 
have closed door meetings on uh, take feedback and provide you know the regulations draft. So uh, Anchorage is part of some of these blockchain associations and then closed door meetings. So we continue to work closely on these institutions um, and building regulations. Uh, so that will be a priority also to work closely with uh, public private partnerships um, and regulators in 2024 to provide feedback on proposed regulatory changes that impact the crypto industry. Uh, the second would be we also noted significant leap forward in travel rule adoption for crypto industry. So 2023, we saw some of these jurisdictions amending and revising travel rule framework with increased scrutiny on unhostable transfers, reduced travel rule requirement thresholds for transactions, etc. So at Anchorage, we adopt a scalable travel rule solution that can be easily adopted across all regulated entities. So 2024, the plan is to further streamline our internal control framework, policies, procedures by working closely with our group compliance and product team in managing AML and sanctions risk. Uh, in response, so we saw that uh, there was a lot of negative press and feedback, right? Late 2022, early 2023, when fund misopportunity mismanagements of incidents from large crypto exchanges in firms. So regulators worldwide have moved towards more stricter rules on custody of customer funds, segregation of roles and responsibilities between different teams and operating within the company, especially where there are conflicts such as trading teams and custody teams, et cetera. Segregation of company assets from client assets, market manipulation, framework to identify insider trading activities, so on and so forth. So the this exponential shift in the regulatory landscape increases the workload on compliance professionals and legal teams across crypto industry. So in 2023, uh, we saw MAS, the regulators in Singapore, came up with various consultation papers on proposed regulatory measures on TPT services, where MAS introduced business conduct measures consumer access measures, technology and cybersecurity requirements, and market integrity requirements, which are applicable uh, going forward to crypto players, which will be licensed in Singapore. So these regulations are still in draft mode, MA, and MA has, has not issued a specific timeline for the implementation. So our goal here uh, is to more identify and perform gap analysis, come up with proposed uh, material gaps and try to meet this requirement before MAS goes live with these regulations. So these I know top three maybe, but yeah, these are like uh, the critical ones I, I can say. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rupa. Okay, Narin, uh, your turn. Top five priorities. Uh, yes, thank you again. So I think uh, Comply on also have a Uh, objective to see the business uh, applicable law and regulation. So uh, the top priority for the bank to ensure the objective is uh, that uh, I have to focus on the uh, compliance and effectiveness implemented by the first line of the fund. So we have established in 2023 a lot of control and document and also process. So this year I will prioritize on uh, the effectiveness and implementation of uh, those uh, 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 of those action uh, to ensure that the frontline they can understand they can uh, implement those effectively. The second priority is the engagement. Uh, I think engagement with the business to ensure that every business decision they will uh, understand about uh, the risk and also they understand about the requirement of the law and regulation as well. So I will uh, pay more time uh, to engage with the uh, business side to understand also about their challenge and also provide them the resolution as well. The other priority is on the uh, technology and the system. So this time I will reactivate some of the system uh, to provide uh, automation uh, rather than the manual because uh, the manual may give us more painful. So we will focus on more on the technology and uh, digitalization uh, that can help us to uh, detect and uh, effectively uh, provide an escalate report to the regulator. 
And the other thing that I prioritize also the anti-bribery corruption and also some uh, red flag. So I will uh, reactivate uh, the transaction rule and some of the uh, parameters so that we can effectively uh, capture the suspicious transaction from uh, any product uh, that offer to the customer. Uh, the last one, I think uh, it is on the data governance and accuracy of the report. So uh, actually we have uh, to do the assessment on the money laundering uh, uh, for the bank buy. So we need to focus on the data, make it consistently and also uh, the accuracy of the report. So in overall, uh, we uh, the, the priority are on the uh, people, are on the uh, process and are on the uh, system to make sure that uh, we uh, look, we will uh, go forward to our objective that uh, the business grow also. Uh, there is no non-compliant uh, issue in the bank. Thanks, all right. All right, uh, Sarvodik, uh, your priorities, I know it's a bit challenging because, uh, you know, to be the last speaker when everybody else has listed their priorities, but uh, over to you. Uh, so for me, I think that uh, the main point first is to uh, setting or update our policy guidelines process uh, to ensuring the uh, standardized and the consistency practice, uh, including the documentation, filing, recording, uh, so that we can uh, go into the, the, the next priority that we setting the report base. So it can give us an uh, overall uh, view of the uh, ML and F theories. So once uh, the, the, they, they have all the information recorded and then we can capture as the report best, then we can have an uh, overview. And the next step is to have that uh, uh, overview risk uh, to be identified where we need to put or enforce the control within so that we can, uh, 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 can be um, uh, fulfill the loophole or the gap in that control uh, to be implemented. And for the fourth one is that um, when we are all in the control and set uh, to what we are need, we are uh, uh, need to conduct the testing and monitoring to, to ensure that, that the control is uh, efficiency and effectiveness uh, implemented or conducted up to the uh, up to date and also uh, reflecting to the actual risk and uh, meeting the bank aspects and the business growth as well. So for the fifth ones, of course, we cannot forget about the um, continue develop our own understanding uh, compliant cultures and share our vision with the stakeholders such as uh, business lines, management and board members uh, because otherwise we cannot uh, accomplish all of this without the engagement. So the engagement from them is very important as well uh, to set the ground, to set the, the, the boat float uh, in the correct directions. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Anuli, uh, for that. Thanks to all the panelists for their five priorities or uh, number of priorities. Now, before we move on to the Q&A, we've got uh, sort of about seven or eight minutes left for Q&A. Let me uh, make a few quick announcements about our upcoming sessions in the next two months so that those of you listening in today can uh, register for it. So we have three uh, workshops coming up. In fact, four. I think there is one uh, missing here. So we have... Um, one in Manila next week, that's on this based customer due diligence. Uh, we have one on the same topic in Cambodia on the 19th of March. So uh, Naren and uh, Shanvalek, I hope to meet you when I come to Cambodia for that. Uh, obviously, when I'm in Manila next week, I hope to see uh, many of our friends in Manila. And then we have our uh, FCAP certification program, which will take place in Thailand and Bangkok uh, on the 20th and 21st of March. And between all of this, on the 8th of Feb, we also have a workshop coming up in Nepal, uh, uh, which will be taken by our faculty, Julia Chin. Uh, and then we have a few uh, virtual workshops uh, coming up uh, in the next uh, uh, month. So one is on red flags and antimony laundering. Uh, that's on the 2nd of Feb. We have one uh, on February 20th, specifically for the Philippines uh, casinos and online gaming companies on AMS CD of best practices. And another one again, uh, specifically for the Philippines uh, on the 22nd of February on anti-bribery and corruption. So these are some of the uh, upcoming uh, workshops that we have both virtual and in person. So uh, all those of you uh, from 
those respective countries uh, may want to take a look at uh, our workshop page uh, on our website and see if you'd like to uh, register uh, and uh, meet all of us over there. Okay, let's, uh, we have a few questions coming in. Um, there was one from Boren uh, Hur. Uh, Boren, good to see you on the, uh, on the webinar. So what are the priorities for your own personal development as a person responsible for compliance of an organization? If each of you can maybe very quickly answer that one. I started drafting it, but then it went midway. I don't know. There were a few questions coming by, right? So personally, I think staying uh, updated in terms of new new up uh, AML uh, technology skills uh, is one of the key priority for me. Plus, uh, understanding any new uh, trainings. Yeah, we also as a head of compliance or MLROs, we also need to do several of trainings. So we also intend to do some of the trainings uh, to understand what are the upcoming trends and uh, you know the risk identified in the jurisdiction. Uh, and yes, definitely on the new regulatory front, keeping ourselves abreast uh, is also quite important from a professional development standpoint. Right. So these are like uh, ongoing uh, things that I do. Sure. Thanks. thanks. Uh, anyone else would like to comment on this? Yeah, uh, as compliance professionals, when we're looking at customers, the most important thing we can do is ask why. And when we're talking to internal stakeholders, the most important message we can get across is so what? So every one of us should always be constantly um, honing our communication skills. Of course, I said arm um, when I'm trying to talk about good communication skills, but <laughs> we, we should be trying to, to do that so that we can build uh, impetus and, and get senior managers and, and, and directors and, and CEOs, et cetera, all on board with this journey because no one starts a bank or a fintech to catch bad guys. If that's your passion, typically you've gone into law enforcement or something else, but we have a vital part, part to play uh, and everyone can always sharpen up their communication skills and get across that message of so what? Why are we doing this and so what? Right. Uh, Naren and uh, Sanvalu, uh, would either of you also like to comment on that question? Uh, you know, what should you do for your personal development uh, in the last profession? Um, I think that um, our um, knowledge is not limited. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, there is a lot of results coming from all the uh, webinar workshops and free uh, um Webinar and some certification from all around the world with the uh, certify and uh, also justify that it was very useful. And I've been attending a lot of those webinars as well that uh, we can also understanding each and other uh, regulation behaviors and casual uh, of the compliance and all of that. So maybe we can starting uh, from that as well to to uh, like such as this uh, webinar to have the um, understanding. Right. Uh, yes, I think uh, keep learning uh, and uh, to develop our professional skill uh, is a very good uh, approach. And also, we also can keep learning uh, from uh, the other and from the mistake as well. So uh, maybe we keep ourselves uh, qualified and open uh, for uh, any study uh, about the other bank control and also keep engagement with the other compliance officers so that we can learn from uh, each other. Right, thanks. Okay, let's take one more question before we end the webinar. I mean, we have many more questions, but I don't think we'll have time for all of them. Uh, so there's one that says that with several conflicts and wars going on around the globe, how can financial institutions prevent funding directly or indirectly to organizations or states that are fueling such conflicts? Is there any FATF advisory or guidance on this? And there was one more, which maybe from Rupa's point of view might uh, also be worth answering. Uh, cryptocurrency and um, is well known by its nature of digital currency trading activities. Um, such activities would involve the money laundering schemes while in some countries uh, are yet having the specific regulation to onboard customers. Uh, uh, you know, what you mentioned that those three buckets that you mentioned. Uh, so what is your uh, you know, advice for the banks to go beyond local regulations? So, you know, we know that during strife, a lot of the uh, funding also happens through maybe crypto. So if you can 
you know, take the question in part A and part B. Uh, that would be great. So, who would like to go first? I mean, Rupa, do, uh, would either of you like to answer either of these questions? Yeah, I'm okay to take the cryptocurrency part. So, uh, if I may repeat the question, Shiri. So, it is, okay. so what is, so they are saying the cryptocurrency landscape is well known for, you know, the underlying technology, right? And then the activities may involve money laundering. Yes, of course, it was, right? While in some countries, they are yet to regulate. So that's why there is a sunrise issue from regulatory standpoint. So there are jurisdictions which have regulated, while there are jurisdictions which are still on the verge of regulating. So while uh, from a retail standpoint, or when you are identifying let's say you want to invest as a retail investor, maybe you see all this hedging and all this, uh, uh, you know, the price is going up, right? So definitely we are inclined to see whether I want to make some profit out of it. So you tend to look for crypto players in the industry to open account. So from, from the consumer standpoint, what I can say is look out for jurisdictions which regulate and the players which are regulated. So at least you see that there are some strict licensing requirements, onboarding requirements, source of income, source of funding requirements, which have been put in place, right? So that's why you feel that. And the important part is, is your fund safe? Is the company commingling your assets with the company assets? Right? Are they holding your funds uh, in a segregated account, in a trust account? So these are the common things or common steps that you should be looking out for when opening a normal crypto account. And then feeling or identifying, okay, there's some jurisdictions have not opened this or not have come up with the regulations. So should I be opening an account with an entity which is incorporated in a jurisdiction which doesn't even have any regulations? So that's a risk element, right? So you're putting, you're playing with your money. So play wisely. So find out which country has more stringent requirements and where this is regulated and try to um, take a risk-based approach. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Rupa. Uh, Lou, would you like to comment on the first question about the conflicts and wars and... <laughs> Look, I think Fata has a place and would, would, uh, would probably admit themselves that they're, the furthest thing from a uh, that they may be political, but they're they're not really uh, in into nation level conflict uh, management. So uh, I was just checking, but you may have seen me flitting around, my eyes looking back and forth. I was just checking that the actions that FATF have taken against Russia, for instance, are illustrative here. They have suspended them as a member. That's fine. They have not placed them on the black or gray list. Okay, so FATF is not your sanctions go to. I think that they wouldn't necessarily uh, disagree with me. Your local regulator and the big ones, so UK, um, OFAC, like I, I know these sanctions better than Australian sanctions because these are the big players. Uh, th those are the ones you want to know. Um, IMF, uh, they, they have more sort of sanctions uh, stuff than FATF, I think. Um, and then in terms of what you can do, KYC, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've mentioned it enough. Uh, KYC is is uh, very, very important for sanctions. But more than that, um, there, there's a really interesting component of this question I could rant about for a long time, which is about the indirect uh, indirect funding and indirect circumvention of sanctions. You, you need to have policies and procedures in place for things like dual use goods uh, and, and uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff and understand what breaks line of sight. So all, all of these come into a good sanctions risk assessment. And I think that that sits separately to AML alongside, and but but not part of it. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Great, thanks. Thanks, Luke. Um, all right, I think we are uh, sort of over time now, five minutes over time. So let's uh, close the webinar. Uh, thank you, Naren. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, uh, Shanvalek. And thank you, Luke, for joining us uh, at this webinar and sharing uh, your time and thoughts uh, with the audience. Uh, we will try and send you some of the other questions which uh, have come in. And if you do have time, uh, respond to them offline, and we will try and get those answers back to the people who asked the question. Um, thanks a lot again to the Asian Bankers Association for supporting uh, this webinar and for being a partner with Fintelect. With that, um, we close this webinar. Thanks, uh, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.